All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining for today's webinar. Today, we'll be discussing examples of bringing together Indigenous and other knowledge for climate resilience. My name is Ryan Patel. I'm the program manager at Alberta Municipalities, and I'm joined by my colleague, Andrea. We'll be your hosts today for the webinar in support of the Climate Resilience Capacity Building Program. We're also joined by some guests, both from the Resilience Institute, as well as members from the Lands Department of Pakani Nation, and you'll get to hear from them a little bit later on. You can see that folks are petering in still, uh, but we'll start with a bit of housekeeping. So as an attendee today, if you're joining live, it's through Zoom, um, and that means your mic and your camera is off if you're an attendee. We do encourage you to engage with us or each other in the chat box. Um, so hopefully you can see the introduction chat just right there and uh, you can navigate your way over there. And we encourage everyone to introduce themselves, uh, share a little bit about yourself or maybe where you're joining from today. And then hopefully you can also orient yourself towards the question and answer box. We'll be using this function uh, throughout the presentation uh, for you to ask questions. And we also have some time set aside towards the end to get to some of the questions. So if you do have a question for any of our guests or perhaps ourselves today, um, please put it in the question and answer box. Uh, we won't be monitoring the chat for questions. And then finally, we will be recording this session and you'll receive a copy of that recording in, in the weeks to come. So if you need to refer back to any of the information, you'll have access there. And then we'll also post some of the contact info uh, later uh, in the slides as well. So with that, we'll move along to the first slide. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Andrea. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, as part of your celebrations and recognition uh, for National Indigenous Peoples Day. June is a celebratory month as well. Uh, I hope you've been taking lots of time to learn and enjoy the festivities for National Indigenous Histories Month as well. We would like to begin this webinar in a good way by respectfully acknowledging that we live, work, and play on the ancestral territories and present-day homelands of many Indigenous, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. We recognize that what we call Alberta is the traditional and ancestral territory of many First Peoples. Veronica and I are joining you from Amiskuchi Beaver Hills in Treaty 6 territory, also known as Edmonton, the lands on which Edmonton sits and the North Saskatchewan River that runs through it have been the site of natural abundance, ceremony and culture, travel and rest, relationship building, making and trading for Indigenous peoples since time immemorial. We would like to acknowledge the many First Peoples whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations and whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant communities. We share this to establish our own practice of acknowledgement and as one part of efforts to push back against settler colonialism and to build better relationships with Indigenous peoples. Through our work in the Climate Resilience Capacity Building Program, we have seen some exceptional examples of Indigenous-led climate adaptation. In the program, 18 Indigenous communities and one tribal council representing an additional six First Nations are completing climate adaptation projects across the province. Today, we are going to hear about one of these cases of Indigenous-led adaptation in Treaty 7 territory with Pagani Nation. As an organization, we are still very much in the early stages of finding out what it means for us to be a partner to Indigenous peoples, the work that we have been involved in, through the CRCB program this past year has been a central part of that process, both personally and as a team. Up until last year, you may know our primary audience has been municipalities, many of them rural communities. Métis writer Chelsea Vowell says that the alliances between rural communities and Indigenous peoples have the potential to be some of the most transformative relationships in this country and yet they remain the least likely to occur. Today, we are going to hear about one such relationship and the role that all municipalities can play to work in right relations with Indigenous peoples in this province. So we share this acknowledgement and reflection as an act of reconciliation, gratitude, and a commitment to pursuing an inclusive, collaborative, 
and respectful path towards building stronger communities. So now I'll turn it back over to Ron for some further comments and some reflections. Thanks, Andrea. So I did want to start with a recognition that June 21st was National Indigenous Peoples Day, which is a day for recognizing and celebrating the history, heritage, resilience, and diversity of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis across Canada. I myself learned that for generations, many Indigenous groups and communities have celebrated their culture and heritage on June 21st or around this time of year uh, because there is some significance to the summer solstice and the longest day of the year. This month is there we go. Uh, sorry, this month is also Indigenous History Month, um, which is a month-long opportunity to learn about the unique cultures, traditions, and experiences of First Nation, Inuit, and Métis. It's a time to honor stories, achievements, and resilience um, for Indigenous people who have lived on this land since time immemorial. And I guess in our plans to recognize, celebrate, and share in the spirit of this month, we we're reflecting on the meaning of reconciliation or our ability to uh, support building renewed relationships with Indigenous peoples based on the recognition of rights, respect, and partnership. And I think um, we can sort of understand how advancing reconciliation touches on a lot of different aspects of lives, and this is outlined in the 94 Calls to action made by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. In our work, which is uh, focused on supporting local climate action, we see a connection with the need to address and prepare for climate change as and that connection with the reconciliation, reconciliation actions that are needed to support strong and healthy Indigenous communities. So in our work, this includes supporting Indigenous communities with climate leadership and co-developing methods, actions, and solutions to not only mitigate and adapt to climate change, but to also advance reconciliation and self-determination. So with that additional context in mind, we come to today's agenda. Um, we'll spend a bit more time, Andrew and I, just reviewing the Climate Resilience Capacity Building Program, sharing some resources that are offered through that. And then we'll move over to our guest for today from Pakani Nation's Land Department, as well as Resilient Institute, who will have uh, the bulk of the hour to talk about um, their, their work and their projects. And then, like I mentioned, towards the end, we'll have question and answer. Again, I'll direct you to put those in the Q&A. Um, we have a lot of folks on the call today. So if you would like your question to be addressed at some points, if you require some follow-up, perhaps leave your contact information if you're comfortable with it in the Q&A. And that way we can ensure that we do get back to you uh, if we aren't able to talk about what you'd like to talk about today. So for those that aren't familiar with um, the Municipal Climate Change Action Center, we were established in 2009 as a collaborative initiative between Alberta municipalities the rural municipalities of Alberta, as well as the government of Alberta. And we provide funding, technical assistance, and education to Alberta communities, nonprofits, and schools in addressing climate change. One of the programs that we offer is the Climate Resilience Capacity Building Program. And we'll go through a quick overview of uh, what this program is all about. So here, the program is designed to help both Alberta municipalities and Indigenous communities in Alberta better understand, cope, manage, and adjust to changing climate conditions. And we have uh, kind of a couple of outcomes that we hope to help communities with, and that's broadening climate resilience literacy, addressing climate vulnerabilities, building climate resiliency plans, and then progressing on risk reduction strategies. Uh, for those that are familiar with the program, um, the bulk of the work is focused on providing funding. Uh, unfortunately, the funding streams are all currently closed, and this is because all the funding has been uh, allocated. Um, but we continue to offer education products and opportunities like today's webinar uh, through our organization. And we also do knowledge product creation. A couple of the resources we wanted to share today include the Climate Resiliency Express Planning Guide, which is a short sort of do-it-yourself approach to a general climate resiliency uh, method. We also manage a community of practice for local practitioners. Um, those can, uh, well, some details around that can be, um, will, will be shared, pardon me, uh, towards the end. Um, and we also do post showcases for the completed projects in our funding streams. Here we've highlighted the project for Elizabeth Métis Settlements. And then we also do have a library of other resources just up on our learning center um, one of which, which feels most pertinent for today, is the Indigenous Climate Resilience Resource Hub. And I'll throw it over to Andrea to quickly cover that.
Yeah, so the Indigenous Climate Resilience Resource Hub is a tool that we developed um, that summarizes existing resources related to climate adaptation and mitigation in Indigenous communities. So it highlights organizations working in this space, case studies of current projects, and available funding opportunities. And it also shares resources to support municipal Indigenous relationship building in the context of climate adaptation. So our intent behind developing this resource was to create something that was accessible to our audience of both municipalities and Indigenous communities. The process of developing this resource um, and becoming familiar with this landscape of Indigenous climate resilience across the province was also a learning experience for ourselves and a chance to build our own awareness. So the objective of this is really to just promote knowledge sharing, learning and conversation around climate adaptation and resilience across the province. And you can find a link to this uh, in the chat and feel free to explore our other resources in our learning center. All right, so with that, we will move along to our guest for today. Um, so our guests for today include Noreen Plainingle, who is a manager at Bakani Nation Lands Department. And we're also joined by Harry Penn, research fellow, and Laura Lyons, president and CEO from the Resilient Institute. Over the last several years, uh, both these organizations, the Resilient Institute and Bakai Nation, have collaborated to figure out how to make the nation resilient in the face of climate change. So this co-creation of activities produces a lot of learnings that um, will see balance uh, indigenous and both scientific research and experts and partnerships. And this is unfolding into several successful projects for the nation, including a greenhouse program, air quality monitoring, flood adaptation strategies, and a youth-led documentation of resiliency strategies. Currently, uh, our county nation is working on a climate change risk assessment report with the Resilience Institute, and that is the project funded through our Climate Resilience Capacity Building Program. And I'd just like to thank our guests for joining us today, and I look forward to uh, hearing about this work. Thanks so much, Ronak and Andrea. Um, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Laura and Henry. You see his name, but he goes by Harry. I'm going to kick off our presentation, and then um, Harry and Maureen, and, and we have um, Tanya with us as well. So just quickly, the Resilience Institute is a charitable organization. We work with rural, small, and Indigenous communities um, across Canada, but a lot in Alberta. And we're actually currently doing climate risk assessments with three Indigenous communities, um, Fort Mackay, Willow Lake Métis, and the Bagani. But this, the topic today is about the Bagani Nation and our partnership. So these slides um, you can revisit later, or check out our website. So the important thing about, I think, where we got to this point of doing a climate risk and vulnerability assessment at this depth is we did a lot of prior work and that began with a local early action plan. We did some climate change education. We had meetings and conversations. And the biggest take home, I think, that I'd like to share, and, and this was reiterated um, at an event on Wednesday at the at Banff National Park, Wednesday, Tuesday, and um, to celebrate our our resilience and uh, a stories of resilience program that the Bagani Nation did um, is trust, time, and reflection. So through this program, we have listened and learned, and then we bring the skills that the community has said they feel they need in order to move the needle on their resilience to climate change impacts. Um, one of these partnerships, this slide is showing how um, after about four years, we got to the point where we were working with scientists with agriculture, um, Agri Canada, to look at how maybe ry rhizome plants might be able to sequester carbon better. And we started with sweetgrass. So we had this whole program that brought together students from the nation, um, a few university students in agriculture, and also um, Environment Canada and climate change scientists and scientists from the University of Lethbridge together with AAFC. And it was a, um, a really neat program. But the reason it worked well is because we were able to 
have conversations with the community. It was about listening to what they needed and wanted. Um, and also with the scientists helping that bridging between this, this world that, and one of the, uh, I think really interesting parts of this is the funding process because the funding was really set up for scientists not at all for um, working with communities or even charities. So we had to find a way to do this work that we wanted, which we all thought was really neat. But then all of a sudden, we are forced into these systems that are not indigenized um, or, and not even transdisciplinary, where we had to somehow um, fit these words and these ideas into documents and agreements and navigate that entire process. Okay, well, we can continue. And this is from, um, this is Miranda Bigbull and she has been involved with a lot of our work since we were doing the local early action planning. She was one of the youth who were involved in that. And then all the way to uh, activity we did called Stories of Resilience. And so this is just a quote from her. Um, Miranda actually spoke recently when we were in, cel in celebration of Aboriginal Peoples Week, we, this Bagani decided that they wanted to also use that as celebration of the Stories of Resilience exhibition that's at the BAMP um, Cave and Basin. And Miranda spoke and she, she talked a little bit about what this quote is indicating. So this connection with youth and having the time to be able to work through programs. Okay, we'll continue. Um, I don't know why I put that there. <laughs> oh yeah, because we're talking about, um, so Pincher Creek. So some, some of this work is about how, so Tanya and Maureen are gonna talk a little bit more about this, but as you know, um, the MCCCAC fund has worked with indigenous communities, but also with some rural communities and Pincher Creek was one of them. So we worked a little bit with the team that was involved with Pincher Creek. And, and again, bridging, because Pincher Creek, of course, wants to have regional resilience, which means working with their partners at the Bagani Nation in a good way. And I think it worked out really well. So I'm gonna, I'll pass this over now to, I think Noreen is speaking, but I'm not sure, Harry can guide it. Yeah, go, go ahead, Noreen. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just to give a little bit of background where we're located, uh, the Begoni Nation is located in Southern Alberta. We're one of uh, four tribes that are part of what we call Siksigaytabi, the Blackfoot Confederacy. And within our nation, we have a community of about 3,600. Um, our community has been very resilient over time. We've had many challenges, but we've always learned to adapt. One thing that we don't have is written history. We rely on our winter count. Our winter count talks about the changes in the seasons and how those cycles occur. But we've also taken those cycles and, and used them as a learning tool as we're, as we're beginning this journey. Um, one of the things that we see um, going forward is that it was very important to create partnerships, partnerships with Example, the town of Pincher Creek, the Old Man Watershed, the Resilience Institute, uh, Waterton Parks, and um, looking at areas that um, are of value to us and how they would apply. And so this is where we really key in on our collaboration with our council. Um, we include, we've incorporated um, our students as part of this process because they're the ones who are going to take that knowledge and move forward with it. So. It's a very key piece of um, what we do right now. And today um, we have a group of students that are out with species at risk with um, looking at how the plants and how the changes are. Um, the, as an example, the Saskatoons are out right now and they're not out this early and they're gonna dry up fairly shortly. So those are things that people are being aware of, um, looking for um, our mint and our sweet grass. That's a key piece that is part of our ceremonies. And those are things that we're lacking because of the way the climate is. So it's monitoring it and looking at how you bridge those gaps. So um, yeah, that's just part of our presentation today. Thank you. 
And so we, to give the second part of the presentation some, some context, um, we have uh, a short video interview um, that I conducted with Tanya Plain Eagle, who's the project manager for the, for the Pekani Lands uh, Department. And so um, I think we'll show that, we'll show that next, please. Okay, my name is Tanya Plain Eagle. I am the project manager at the Bikani Nation Lands Department. I am from the Bikani Nation. So the town of Pincher Creek recently conducted a climate vulnerability and risk assessment and reached out to Bikani as part of their engagement. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience, uh, how that was and, and how it might help strengthen the regional response to climate adaptation? The experience working with the town of Pincher Creek was nice. It was a learning experience for me. Um, just being from Bikani, working within the nation for about maybe five, six years, um, my involvement or my, um, I guess just my involvement with Pincher Creek has been limited. I've never really um, been a part of the community or understood the community. So it was kind of nice to work with them, get to know them and um, kind of learn, learn what their priorities are. And it was a um, kind of an eye opening when it came to us as a nation and us as First Nations, like we're neighboring communities and we um, experience a lot of the same weather patterns. But um, from a First Nations perspective, like Wow. It was interesting to see their focus compared to our focus. Like, and do you think that has a benefit from a regional perspective, um, working together? Yeah, definitely. Um, I know we already have a, have a couple of mutual aid agreements and being able to work with the MD and the town, it just kind of um, creates more space and more opportunities for other um, mutual aid agreements, right? Because then we'll start talking about, well, it's not only fire, it's flood, it's wind, it's everything. Um, you know, like the weather doesn't just stop at the borderline with the Bikani Nation, right? So we're, that's what I mean. We often seem to see the same effects. So if there's uh, opportunity to help each other, then yeah. And so when we are thinking about the the climate vulnerability and assessment risk assessment process that we're we're going through. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about the strategies that you're using and working with with partners to ensure that it's it's relevant to to the community and to the county nation? Um, a lot of community engagement. One of the things that I always find beneficial is um, bringing these questions out to the community, right, and seeing where the community is. Um, where they're at and they're thinking when it comes to climate change. Um, like some people, when you hear climate change, you're kind of, you have some people that's, that are like, oh, it's, it's nothing. Or some people are the opposite and they're very extreme about it. And then, um, but it's that idea of creating that, that awareness or that education that yes, climate change exists, um, but these are how, this is what we're doing to, um, mitigate some of the stuff that we're currently seeing and one of the things that we we had talked about um, like me and Noreen was um, let's let's not focus so much fear around climate change like let's try to change that stereotype because um, one of the bigger things that we're facing right is drought and like to myself sometimes that gets a little overwhelming like what are like what are we actually going to do like we're we're a couple of people kind of facing such a big problem and we're like, well, maybe we got to approach it in a different way, in a healthy way, and maybe then we'll be able to find some answers and maybe we'll get the community to listen or be on board and supportive of some of the initiatives because really that's one of the only ways we're going to get um, get things done is by, by community support. So for the for the remainder of the presentation, and actually I should just say that um, Tanya and I filmed that at uh, at the recent um, Stories of Resilience event at the uh, Cave and Basin. So some of the background noise was lots of people coming in to enjoy the event and uh, 
and we've mentioned it already today but I, anybody that can get to that uh that display and that exhibition i would highly recommend going some of the stories are are, are really quite wonderful to, to be able to read and, and and learn from so yeah so for the rest of the presentation we are going to discuss a, a current and an ongoing um project that uh that the Kani first nation are, are leading with the resilience institute um that's funded through the through the municipal climate change action centers climate resilience capacity building program um, and this project, as has been mentioned, is part of the uh, is to develop a climate risk assessment. Um, and we are doing this in partnership with not just the Pakani First Nation, but also universities, researchers, uh, and the private sector. And so the uh, the project is sort of broken out into into a few different pieces. So initially, we're approaching the climate risk assessment from a fairly standardized approach, which is to say that the, the risk assessment uh, or the score to any given climate hazard is calculated from the likelihood of that uh, hazard happening based on a score of, of one to five, uh, multiplied by the consequence of that climate hazard happening also on a, a score of one to five. And so the climate parameters that, that are selected, um, and I'll discuss shortly, are, are a broad range and, and sort of cover any climate related hazard. Um, our project partners at the Prairie Adaptation Research Collaborative Park and David Salshin at the University of Regina have used climate models and developed a specific regionalized and downscaled climate model for the Pakani Nation at a resolution of 25 square kilometers. And so the likelihood score is, is based on, on any climate hazard and, and the projections from those climate models. Then in partnership with the, with associated engineering, uh, we and and working alongside the Pakani First Nation, having them to, to drive this process, we break apart all those climate hazards and overlay uh, any existing planning and assessment work that Pakani have done um, in the community and as well any you know local traditional Blackfoot knowledge, and we develop a series of impact statements that can be assigned a consequence score on a on a low to high ratio. And so this is an approach to a climate risk, risk assessment that weaves uh, Blackfoot and indigenous knowledge and values, but and mobilizes um, external expertise and a Western science approach. And so the climate hazards that we are assessing, are there's 15 of them. Um, we don't assume any seasonality with, with any particular climate hazards. So uh, a high wind event, for example, could happen in the summer or, or could happen in the winter. And, and while some hazards may be more relevant uh, than others, this is determined by the community. This is led by, by the community and, and we understand the, the relevance as we go through the, through the process of the project. So planning to implementation, um, each climate hazard is considered um, on the basis of four different, um, I suppose, sectors. The first is the built system, so, so infrastructure, um, the natural system, the social system, or how um, how community would operate in the face of a climate hazard, uh, and where relevant, the, the economic system. And so TRI has been working alongside the Pakani Nation for a number of years, um, and it has established uh, long-term partnerships and working relations, um, which greatly benefit the this kind of, of planning activity. Um, and just as importantly is the level of preliminary work um, and, and building readiness, developing knowledge um, in the community to inform this, particularly this step of the risk assessment. Essentially, what we're doing is we're distilling uh, all previous work, assessments, plans, uh, and knowledge um, onto the impacts and, and assessments uh, of, these, of these impacts. And so what this gets us to is is an opportunity to kind of weave all these different knowledges together. And so for each climate hazard, we develop a series of impact statements or, or consequence statements, and they really represent all the different outcomes um, across the four different systems for any given climate hazard. And then, so that's brought together all the local knowledge of climate hazard impacts, any previous planning assessment, uh, and built these statements. And then these statements can be reviewed they can be assessed, they can be discussed, and then ultimately they are, are given a consequence score uh, against a rubric providing an opportunity for scoring one, 
as a low consequence or, or high as a, as a high consequence. And so once we've once we've sort of gone through this process, particularly with the with the consequence scores, and we've overlaid then the likelihood of from the from the climate models, we come to this decision framework. And so what we're able to plot here is is the sort of the results of the climate risk assessment uh, process and and display them on this on this framework. This provides an important framework for decisions and climate hazard adaptations, and importantly, an opportunity to consider short, medium and long-term adaptation strategies. Essentially, a climate hazard is, uh, a climate hazard risk, excuse me, is considered in the broader landscape of all other climate hazards and risks, not just in isolation. And so it may be that we have gone through this process and we've scored some risks in the upper right most uh, section of the framework, so those in, in red, but perhaps addressing risk in, in the orange or yellow sections first provides an immediate result uh, maybe increases community capacity to address climate risks more broadly. It perhaps increases, uh, perhaps it could increase um, future adaptation strategies or even lower climate hazard elsewhere in the framework. Um, it may even provide guidance. Um, this framework may even provide guidance for early actions that, that communities could take in lieu of additional funding for, for adaptation. And so being able to plot everything on, on one map here together on one framework really gives us an opportunity to consider the whole climate hazard lens in, in one go. Um, and so these are some of our experiences, um, some of the opportunities and, and lessons that we've we've learned um, from working across multiple disciplines and, and knowledge systems and perspectives um, that, is in, that is included and, and been led by uh, the Pakani Nation, um, private sector and, and researchers and universities. Um, and I think it's a way that has led us to have a more shared language, um, addressing expectations of climate risk, hazards, and, and adaptation um, for them. Um, so questions I think we have have some time for, and um, any that we don't get to today, is, as, uh, as were mentioned at the top of the presentation, we'll, we'll happily, uh, if you leave your contact information, we'll, we'll do our very best to get back to you. And, and Harry, I'm going to add, because you also triggered a, a thought um, that when we're talking about weaving, of course, there's lots of really rich literature about what does weaving or braiding or bridging, there's lots of different words being used to describe it. But um, so there's theory around it, but what does it actually mean in practice? And it's hard. Um, how do you define? How do you do that? And how do you know that you you've actually done it and done a good job. So one of the things that we have created is um, a bit of a matrix, um, a reflection matrix, I guess we can call it, where, where teams can, there's, there is good practices. So there's emerging and there's current good practices about what this looks like. So you take those points and then teams can reflect, did we do this? Um, did we listen to the community? Are we building trusting relationships? Are we being responsive? Because you're really, you're talking about two fundamentally different worldviews coming together and then trying to do something, whether that's a climate adaptation plan or whether it's the implementation of climate strategies. And so the words you use matter, the approach matters, and, and how you do this together matters. And one very small, ta just a tangible example is when we were working with this scientist from Agriculture Canada and University of Lethbridge and ECCC and the community, the community said, yeah, okay, well, you can't just come here and take sweet grass. You can't just, we're not just gonna do this. You have to do this in a good way. And for us, this is what it means. And they said, we wanna do a partner transfer, a, a partner ceremony where we are officially saying we are partnering with you and we're having elders involved and we have the youth involved and this is what it needs to look like. So we listened to that and we factored that into the whole process. But it also could look like there's been, um, there's sometimes um, a prayer or singing or something that happens before an action takes place. And those are not small things. These are actually, so if scientists were saying, oh, this is a, a process maybe, I'm, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm saying this very loosely, but where some knowledge systems might not realize that this is actually 
the scientific or the process and the value system of the community that needs to be um, validate, it's valid, and it needs to be part of the entire process that you're doing. So, so when we say words like engagement, that doesn't just mean showing up and asking somebody to talk for a little while. It's deeper than that. And defining what that means for teams as you're working together to solve some of these bigger challenges with climate adaptation, I think is really important. That's it. Thanks. No, no, thanks, Laura. And thanks, Harry and Noreen, as well as um, Tanya, who joined us in the recording. Um, maybe we'll switch slides here, but I really appreciate all of you sharing um, about this project, especially because the work is still underway. Um, and that makes it, of course, difficult to reflect on as you're kind of in the midst of doing, doing the work. Um, but we do have some time for questions. So yeah, I'll invite people to submit them in, in the Q&A. Uh, perhaps to get us started, um, I'll ask a question. Um, so it, it seems really evident that central to this practice of weaving or braiding or bringing together uh, is just um, the ability to have a team of people, whether that's internal, external, within the community, uh, outside of it, uh, bringing them together to talk about um, Maybe Harry, this question will be for you. Um, the, this process of having climate data and then overlaying it with you know indigenous knowledge. Um, how is that done? Like logistically, like through a workshop or like a online session? How do you like, tangibly do the action of of weaving? Um, well, I, maybe what I can do is I can answer from from my perspective, and then I can I can call on um, my fellow. Uh, presenters and, and particularly Noreen to to maybe give a perspective as well. Um, I, I would say that the the first the first thing is is listening um, because we are all coming at um, a risk assessment process and 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 discussion of climate change and, and climate hazards from our own particular perspectives and and knowledges and, and expertise. And I think everybody that we are fortunate enough to work with on this uh, on this project ha has got all of those and and you know everyone's got expertise in their own space um and I think giving everyone an opportunity to to listen and and particularly to be guided by uh by Bikani Nation and by Noreen and, and Tanya in the lands department uh lets us kind of actually see pretty pretty quickly I, I think I'm always I really enjoy the process of of realizing kind of how well all these different knowledge systems come together they they are in their in their nature uh complementary uh they they go together i think and and learning from learning from Bikani nation um on how to how we can best bring our expertise i think is the first step to to the weaving process Right, right. Perhaps less of, you know, forcing things together, but more of like, how do these pieces all, all fit? And, and I think it, I think it's also not being afraid to, to change, to change the process, you know, just because we've maybe all gone through one process uh, before and, and that's worked in that instance doesn't mean that it necessarily should or has to uh, work again. You know, we can, we can always take opportunities to review, uh, mm -hmm review how we're working and, and which bits are working and, and move forward from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Laura, Noreen, any, any thoughts on sort of like the actual day-to-day -day of how do you do this work? I guess just coming from the perspective from the nation is looking at that, that key piece of engagement. You know, we talk about listening and understanding that there's parts of our language that is not written, and the meaning that's there, you know, and how we're going to explain it um, in that aspect. And then we take that knowledge and we utilize our the support from our elders and our and especially our youth, you know, we we kind of collaborate those two bridges together and start looking at what the common goal is. But we also really have to use examples of what's happening today. You know, people are seeing the weather patterns, they're seeing the lack of being able to find plants in our community. And so really taking it and saying, you know what, we need to take a bit of a step forward and looking at the scientific piece of it. Is that going to help us? Is that going to support us? So um, when we're explaining it, we're explaining it um, in a holistic view. 
and um, what what do they want to see? We don't just put it on them and say, well, this is what we're going to do. You know, we we ask the questions. What is what is climate change to you? What have you seen um, in the weather patterns? You know, what have you seen lack of in our community? And so that's where um, you know we take that perspective, and our traditional knowledge is always um, front and center before we do anything else. Well, I'll just um, add a little bit to that because as Maureen said, the traditional knowledge is front and center, it's, but it, it, it's values. So ensuring that values are represented in at the beginning and during the process and at the end of the process, that it's not just symbols or colors of a community. Um, it's not just local knowledge about observations. We all do that in communities, cities and rural communities too. It's the values that are woven in there. And does it, um, what is the value of trees? What does an asset mean? Does an asset um, just build infrastructure and natural? What about bundles? What about sacred places? Um, and considering those and being able to have those discussions. One of the reasons we like to use the term weaving over other terms is because it's when you, when you usually when you braid something, it's the same thing. I could braid my hair, it's the same. But weaving is different, um, sometimes different textiles, bringing those together. Um, and then together they produce something that should be robust and strong and together it's better. So that's how we think of this is, as Maureen was talking, how do you bring those values then and the science? So we know we're bringing these projections, but we also have, well, what are you about? What are your, what are your observations and your values about those observations together to produce something that would look like a relevant plan, a community plan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Details around youth engagement. I know Andrea had played this earlier, so I'll give her kudos. Um, but but Noreen, I'm just curious, like how is the youth engagement done in, in the nation? Um, are the youth responsive? Are they you know ready to kind of speak to what they care about, or or is it done in more of like a structured manner? So in the last couple of years, we've really looked at who um, our, our, like our, about, our, um, I guess our key focus would be, right? And so we partnered with the school, we partnered with their science teams, we partnered with them over the summer months, and we were able to utilize them on our field trips, take them out, share their ideas. And um, a couple, probably about three, four weeks ago, we had an overall engagement session with them. That's like the, about the third or fourth time we've had it with the school and offered their ideas, you know, offered them um, the opportunity to look at what a perfect, what a world would look like um, with climate change, what's happening with them and how they perceive that. And so we've got them thinking. Um, one of the kind of neat things that happened was when we, had them over at the school, um, a parent told us, you know what, um, I don't know what you did to my kid that day because um, they came home and they told me I, we have to compost, you know, and, and you can't throw away those that cardboard anymore. And what are we going to do? Should we plant a garden, you know, and he said, that's the impact that you had on my child that day that um, your team presented to them. And I thought, mm -hmm. you know what, that's where um, collaborating has left an impact on them and students are coming forward and saying you know what we want to look at the environmental sciences because that's where our community really lacked was that interest in that piece of it right for for their post-secondary and now students are starting to talk about wanting to go into environmental sciences so that's a real plus for us mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I see a great synergy. I know uh, we've talked about Pincher Creek. Uh, I know those folks have been doing some great youth engagement in, in their own project. Uh, so it's great to see that alignment. Um, maybe a last question for me. Um, what are some next steps or perhaps hopes with the relationship building with Pincher Creek? Um, you know, it, it can be in the context of you know this climate adaptation work or generally if you'd like to reflect on that too. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Anya. Hey. Hi. So I guess like next steps and hopes when you when it's when it comes to working with Pincher Creek is uh, right now we've really established uh, like a good relationship with Pincher Creek, which uh, I haven't seen before. I guess to this level where you're sharing ideas and you're kind of breaking down that boundary, that invisible border that's always been there. And so the hopes is that, you know, one of the big things that I mentioned in the interview was that it was more mutual aid agreements or being able to move, to help each other when it comes to climate change or what are some, um, some things that they feel like they're seeing an increase of and, you know, sharing that information that, yeah, we're, we're seeing the same things here when it comes to like infrastructure or some of the, the risks, some of the damages that happen when it comes to some of these severe conditions. So it's, you know, hoping that there's a better understanding between the two communities. Uh, yeah, and then I don't know if it's a possibility mm -hmm. that we can hear from them when we put together our climate kind of risk assessment and just kind of getting an understanding of what their thoughts are from, from their perspective. Yeah, I know there are some 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 folks from Pitcher Creek on the call, so hopefully that resonates with them specifically. Um, yeah, there's Tristan perfectly. He says absolutely. So I'm glad to see that relationship flourish as a function of this. Um, so looking at the Q and A, there's a question from our friends at the Beaver Hills Biosphere. Um, I think this is maybe more for Laura and Harry, but they're just curious: How did the Resilient Institute, as an organization, begin building the connection with Pecani Nation in a way that's not paternalistic, but supports the needs of the community? That's a great question. Um, actually, I think Noreen should start the answer to this because um, she approached us. And, mm -hmm. and so maybe, are you comfortable answering that, Noreen, that question? Um, OK, how much are you going to pay me? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I see. It's a fiscal relationship. <laughs> uh, no, we, um, you know, we met um, the Resilience Institute at a um, at a Keepa summit on the Blood Tribe, and they were they've been really active, you know, for years on on um, you know on keepers of the land and and the climate change, what's happening in that, and um, we kind of took a back seat on that for a long time because we were afraid to really ask that question out there, unsure of what the answers were gonna look like. And when we started talking with Laura and hearing all the plans that they've been doing in the projects, you know, we got excited. We introduced her to our chief and council and our council said, you know what, absolutely. This is an opportunity for us to move forward and look at really how, um, what's happening in the world around us and how we're going to move forward and how we're going to create that collaboration. And so, you know what, it's been nonstop. There's been project after project that has been successful. And um, like Laura spoke about the stories of resilience, um, people are just like in awe of the magnitude of that project. And now they're stepping up and they're saying, okay, what's next? What's on, you know, what, what is, what are um, your plans going forward? Because we're ready to participate. So it's opened that door and it's opened that awareness. So, you know, I I, um, I give a lot of respect to the Resilience Institute on, on what they've brought into our community. Thanks. And just to add to that, that um, it wasn't prescriptive. It was really about listening. So, and, and being honest about what we do and what we don't do. And then connecting where if there was needs that had to do with climate change, that's something we don't do. We just make that connection. But but also be, having the flexibility because we're not a large academic institution, we have we're nimble. And when a community says we want to do this, but we want it to be youth led, we were able to design a community appropriate approach to climate adaptation or to resilience building. And Stories of Resilience is an example because it was, well, we really want to, alongside doing this planning and these and implementing these, um, you know, some of the some of the deep, the the deeper work, we also want engagement. So and we want education, mm -hmm. but we don't want somebody standing there talking at us all the time. Like, how many presentations can you do? And is that really education? 
So it was education that was um, collaborative and, and purposely designing programs that brought youth together with elders, but also other departments in the community. And that's, and so Stories of Resilience is a really good example of that because it's not just, oh, let's gather some stories. It's we're learning to first, so there's a whole program around that where they're learning about some climate impacts that are relevant, I mean, localized. Um, they're learning about global. They're talking about how to do they learn interview skills. Then there's, so there's this momentum that also gets built when they share it back to the community. But that really helps the other work that we're doing. So when it comes time mm -hmm. to say, you know, when Noreen's department says, you know, we really need to do um, X, Y, Z of a strategy to deal with drought now and flooding, people are with us. They're, they get it. They're on board. And there's a there's that connection. So so I hope that answers your question. It's a good one. Um, and it's very much in the, the approach being when we use the terms um, co-creating and community-based work, then, then what does that actually really mean? And for us, this is what it has meant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think perhaps a connection with this next question on, on sort of what are some of like the preliminary tasks or work that can be done to support communities in preparing to do like a formal climate risk assessment? So I guess like some of those pieces I think you've shared do connect to, you know, having some capacity to undergo that work, but any other recommendations on some of that, like those pieces on, on the prelim work? And I think we, we did talk about this actually uh, in our planning session too. So hopefully not catching you on, on your toes too much. No, but I'd say maybe a word of caution is that if you don't do that preliminary work and you, and you don't have... Mm. A trusting relationship and trust that I mean it doesn't have to be 10 years but if you don't have some of that um, foundational work and you just try to do a climate risk assessment you might get a great you might get a product that comes out but is it going to be um, taken up by the community is there going to be buy-in by leadership to be able to implement those strategies and that's like we we don't have time to waste so even though the the upfront work may take a little longer and the engagement um, may take a little longer. It's in the long run, it's gonna be much more effective and efficient to do it. Mm -hmm, right. Yeah, that's a good point of advice to maybe frame it the other way. Um, yeah, so just taking a look in the Q&A here, here's a specific question um, about the Bacani pincher Creek relationship. Um, is there an actual intercommunity knowledge base where information is distilled and available in a valid, blended, and shared language that is also linked back to school curriculum? I'm not sure if we'll know the details around this. I think we could um, try and answer this question offline if that works too, but um, Noreen, perhaps if you are aware of any kind of um, formal uh, connections that are, that are being made across the communities. Or I think telling us there too, perhaps. So um, I guess uh, Tanya's participation in the risk assessment is is really a starting point. You know, there's mm -hmm. other um, there's other programs that you know we share with Pincher Creek, and our students go there. Um, there's different, um, I guess we are a lot of our members. They participate in activities there, right? And there's um, um, examples that we're taking away from there, like they have a biodiversity program. It's along, it's along the creek. They do a learning program. And so that's something that um, we're creating as a goal for us in our River Valley. And so just really sharing a lot of the ideas. Um, and in terms of the risk assessment, it's just it's a starting point for us. We've we've looked at that support. We've had a conversation, and you know we're we're very willing to move forward with that partnership with them. Great, yeah, that's that's perfect. I think I think if this person, if you need a follow up, um, I think you can reach out to like you see the slides here myself or perhaps to Harry, and I think you can feel the question for Akani. Um, it seems like maybe you have some context that uh, is specific, so. Um, hopefully that is enough to get that conversation going. I yeah, love that idea. Like, could you yeah. imagine if everywhere had, anyway, that's, it's a, 
it's a fantastic question and idea. Yeah, I think I think maybe the point also around like, you know, who is the knowledge accessible by you know those outside of the project, right? You know, publicly available. Um, that sort of piece is interesting too. But maybe just considering time, we'll leave the questions uh, at that. Um, there is an opportunity to continue the conversation. Um, so if you would like, you can reach out to the email addresses here. Um, that would be great to um, connect with uh, anyone. Um, we also do have a upcoming community of practice meeting. Um, so we manage a community of practice, like I mentioned at the top of the call. Um, this is a space that's an informal gathering of climate adaptation practitioners. So from Alberta municipalities, as well as from Indigenous communities in Alberta, that's largely staff, but in some cases, uh, local leaders too. And it's a space to share knowledge, lessons learned, and celebrate success on climate adaptation and resilience. Um, and our next meeting is coming up in, in July here um, on the morning of the 11th. And we'll be continuing parts of this conversation with the Resilience Institute. So if you are eligible, we would invite you to join our community practice. Uh, we have 40 odd participants, but I'm um, happy to bring more folks to the table. Um, if you don't fit this eligibility, don't worry, please feel free to reach out anyway. Um, we're happy to connect uh, in other ways as well. And with that, we'll just sort of finish off with a final thank you, uh, first of all, to all of our guests, um, to Maureen and Tanya, who was able to join, as well as Laura and Harry. Thank you so much for your time and your insights. Really appreciate you sharing um, what you did today. And then also thank you for everyone who joined as an attendee. We hope, hopefully, we hope this was a helpful presentation, sharing this with you. Um, hopefully you're walking away with some ideas or at least an awareness uh, in this space. And yeah, look forward to staying connected and um, hosting future conversations. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. Nice to see that in the chat. Thank you, everyone. And uh, yeah, thank you so much to our guests for being here.